Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Yes. All right. All right, so let's do anemias. There are three categories of anemia. Anemias can either be caused by decreased production of red blood cells. Examples of this are... What chapter? Um, this is 33, page 664. Oh, I was saying there are three categories of anemias. Anemias can either be caused by decreased production of red blood cells, such as either you have a autoimmune deficiency, for instance, or you have aplastic anemia, or you have a nutritional um, deficiency. So let's say under decreased production of red blood cells, the decreased production can either be caused by a bone marrow defect, such as in aplastic anemia, or it could be caused by treatment for cancer, for instance, or it could be from cancer, wherein you have bone marrow suppression. Or others are nutritional deficiencies, such as if you have a poor diet, your diet is poor in iron, poor in B12, or poor in folic acid. It could also be caused by pregnancy. Um, so whatever the cause, the end result is you have a decreased ability to um, produce red blood cells. Another could be you have a good nutritional intake of all the nutrients in the world. However, you lack the ability to absorb it, such as you have a malabsorption syndrome or you have, in the case of pernicious anemia, for instance, you don't have the intrinsic factor which allows you to absorb B12. So it's it's a lot of causes but all lead to a decreased ability to produce red blood cells. Another question of how long do red blood cells typically live? 90 days, 20 days, wait, 120, 120, 120. Okay. all right, 120 days. So let's say you have a defect wherein your red blood cells do not live 120 days. An example of that is polycythemia vera, which is one of our topics today. Another is sickle cell anemia, wherein your, your red blood cells sickle uh, and are abnormally shaped. So leading to uh, increased clotting, and of course that is anemia because these tickled cells cannot carry oxygen. So as a result, you have anemia. The third category is blood loss. It, it covers acute and chronic blood loss. Uh, acute, of course, is hemorrhage, for instance, or acute, any other form of acute bleeding. Um, and then of course, chronic bleeding, bleeding is slow. Know, over time, such as it's so what happens in you remember chronic kidney disease? Those people on dialysis, they have anemia too, right? Because they don't have erythropoietin. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So if if you have CKD, where will that fall? Is that under blood loss, decrease RBC production? or increase destruction of blood, red blood cells? Decrease production. Decrease production. All right, very good. So one question would be as simple as that. So where would you where would you put a sickle cell, for instance? Is it decrease destruction. destruction. Very good, increase destruction. All right, so you got the concept. Anemia is still under the concept of perfusion because this is under oxygenation, um, particularly oxygen transport. All right, you with me? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's under yeah. oxygen transport because it's really the red blood cells that carry oxygen, right? So in effect, it will affect oxygenation. Yes? Yes. 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 Okay, so with, with people with anemia, what is therefore your priority goal for the patient. 
oxygenation. All right, so you want to maintain good or adequate oxygenation. So what would be your priority intervention? You have an anemic patient, symptomatic, they are short of breath, they look pale, they have low blood pressure. What is your priority action? Oxygen. Give oxygen. All right. What do you do with the activity level? Rest. All right. So balance, activity, and rest. Okay. So again, all these things, the concept is oxygenation and perfusion. So you have a decreased oxygen transport as a result of anemia. The anemia, again, falls under three categories. Either you have your patient has a decreased ability to produce red blood cells. They have an increased rate of red blood cell destruction or they're having acute or chronic blood loss. All right. So start with nutrition. This is about uh, assessing your patient. So what could be causing the, the, um, the anemia? So you try to ask questions. Number one is on nutrition. Uh, so if the nutrition checks out fine, um, could it be that they're not absorbing the nutrition? So that's another um, question you, you should consider. These are the sources of or the, the um, purpose of certain vitamins and minerals in the process of red blood cell production. So we have vitamin C and these are the sources, folic acid, B6, B12, vitamin K, and then so on. Now, what is the significance of this table? So if a patient, let's say, comes in with folic acid deficiency anemia, what foods will you include in the teaching? Can you repeat that? Okay, again. In, um, let's say the patient is admitted for folic acid deficiency anemia. What foods will you include in the teaching? Green leafy vegetables, legumes, liver, legumes. And as always, you know how it is, right? On the exam, will I put green leafy vegetables? No. No, no I will like kale, spinach, spinach etc. <laughs> All righty. All right. And of course, look at the blood cell functions for each one. So here, vitamin C, it's not really vitamin C that produces red blood cell, but it will facilitate absorption of iron. You, know, you can take gallons of iron, but without vitamin C, does it make you, does it, is it any good? No. 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 So when you, with your intake of iron, that should be coupled with or paired with vitamin C absorption. And these are your food sources for those. And go on with uh, vitamin B6 and B12. Okay. Um, based on the list, look at this. I mean, almost all foods contain these nutrients, right? Um, but what if you have a patient who doesn't like vegetables or fruits? Uh, give them orange juice. They gotta eat. Oh, well. All right, so that's where your um, creativity comes in now. Mm -hmm. Or you have, um, let's say, um, vegetarians. You have vegans, for instance, who don't eat meat. How will they get their B12s? Legumes, vegetables. Uh, Legumes. We have other, we have plant sources for those as well. All right. So this is again all about application. So the question on this will of course be uh, client teaching or what will you serve? Question will go, which of the following menus will you serve a patient with iron deficiency anemia or B12 or pernicious anemia, okay, B12 deficiency, so on. Uh, medications can also affect it. You already looked at peptic ulcer disease. And, you know, NSAIDs will do what to the GI tract? And we need the stomach in order to absorb uh, B12 specifically and iron. And decrease the mucus production. For, All right. Um, so you already know the story about NSAIDs. So watch about those. Mm -hmm. uh, plus also NSAIDs. 
especially when coupled with uh, anticoagulants that will increase bleeding. So your problem for anemia could be uh, chronic or acute bleeding. Mm -hmm. These are some of the drugs uh, that affect your red blood cell count, of course, through acute or chronic bleeding. There's nothing new. You've already talked about this. Anticoagulants under PE, DVT, uh, fibrinolytics, uh, particularly for us under stroke, and we did a TPA um, simulation uh, last semester. Then we have uh, same thing for acute coronary syndrome. This was MedSurge 1. Um, you already talked about Flavix or Clopidogrel. For, um, let's say you're assessing a patient's medication history, which drugs will be a source, could be a possible sources of anemia for the patient. This will fall under the bleeding, uh, the <coughs> acute or chronic bleeding category. These are your list. A, that would be a very good select all the five question, box 33-1. Um, you should know these uh, by now. You should be familiar with them. Um, hydroxychloroquine is gaining a lot of media attention because of Trump. I don't know where he got the idea that this thing co treats COVID-19. Uh, only <laughs> God knows. It's in here. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I was tripping when I heard that. Okay. As far as signs and symptoms, regardless of the type of anemia the patient has, whether it's a plastic, um, iron deficiency, etc., whatever, if the patient has anemia, whether it's caused by red blood cell, increased red RBC destruction, decreased RBC production, or blood loss, the signs and symptoms are the same. There are a few differences um, attributed to a specific type of anemia, but those are very few. Um, without looking at the textbook, okay, so let's uh, cover that. What do you think will be the patients presenting signs and symptoms if they have less oxygen carrying capacity? Shortness of breath. Number fatigue. one, very good. Fatigue, what about mental status? Decrease in irritability. Okay, any uh, a change, right? Change in mental status could be confusion, yeah. restlessness, uh, agitation. Yeah. What else? Could there be cognitive decline also? Yes. Yeah, especially during exams, right? You're not breathing, you're not aware that you're not, your respiratory rate is dropping. So there's no uh, less oxygen going to your brain. That's why you can't figure out some questions. Right, so consider so that. Yeah, That's don't me. forget breathing. Okay, so breathe during the test. <laughs> That's a good tip. Uh, so with this central signs and symptoms, what else? Uh, let's go with peripheral. Peripheral signs and symptoms of anemia. Pallor. Cool. Okay, skin is be pale. What about your cap refill? Uh, Decrease. Okay. Um, uh, mucous membrane color. Blue. Pale. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, what about Chill. changes in the um the, the nails? Then the, the nails will look what? What will be the shape Club. of your finger? Club. Club. Okay, Club. Clubbing. Yeah. So you saw finger clubbing in COPD patients, right? Yeah. Remember yeah. that was from chronic hypoxia, which you will have also in anemia. So clubbing is not only because of COPD, it is also a um a what is this a compensatory change um yeah, yeah to the chronic anemia and we have um here that the tongue look at this <clears throat> so this is one of the symptoms that are specific so under uh, iron deficiency or pernicious anemia also uh, iron deficiency of course that's from deficiency in either iron intake or iron absorption Pernicious anemia is um, B12 deficiency. Uh, or it could also be um, a deficiency of, or the absence rather, of an intrinsic factor. Is this an enzyme produced by your stomach 
which is necessary to absorb B12. Um, it happens with gastric surgery patients because they lost part or all of their stomach, so they don't have the intrinsic factor, so they will have per pernicious anemia. So those patients require B12 injections for life because they can't absorb it anymore. So this is one specific um, example. So the tongue will look very shiny and red. Um, it will look smooth here. We have a smooth tongue. Uh, because if you look at your tongue, I mean on the mirror, I don't know, you can't see your tongue, but if you look on, in the tongue, in the mirror, you see these um, dots, right? You see these, um, uh, what, what do you call them? Yeah, round things on, on top of your tongue. If you have iron deficiency anemia or pernicious anemia, your tongue will lose those uh, circles. They will appear like really smooth and shiny. <laughs> We call that glossitis. This is chula, please. Lower the volume. This is chula, chula. Thank you. Um, respiratory assessment. You guys already told me the there is uh, shortness of breath or there is uh, increased respiratory rate. Uh, cardiovascular, of course, that will lead to what happens to your heart rate. It increases. Increases. Increase heart rate. Blood Increase. pressure will decrease. decrease. All right. There could also be heart valve problems here. You, you can hear murmurs Beth. because um, hy yeah. hypoxemia, <laughs> hypoxemia will lead to um, decreased cardiac perfusion and it may damage uh, heart valves already, it may cause irregular heartbeats as a result or even result in heart failure. Kidneys. This is a peripheral organ, so this will be one of the um, organs that will suffer from uh, anemia. Meaning, will anemia trigger your sympathetic nervous system? Uh, yes. yes. Yes, because that will result in decreased mm -hmm. cardiac output, decreased oxygen level. So the kidneys may so show some signs of injury. Okay, you may see signs of kidney failure as well. Musculoskeletal, uh, of course, that will, there will be weakness. Uh, and then abdominal assessment, same thing, less blood flow to peripheral organs that will decrease your peristalsis because there's less um, perfusion to the GI tract. Then you'll have um, constipation, etc. Well, let's go to specifics. Oh, let's uh, finish the general first. So, of course, you can diagnose anemia simply by your complete blood count. The doctor will make a decision based on the shape and size of your hemoglobin. Um, these are a few. I'm not testing these. Okay, um, this is just FYI. So you have the doctor can make a diagnosis based on the again the shape on uh, that would be the morphology the the shape of your red blood cells as well as their size. Uh, others are your iron levels. Uh, I think they're mentioned here. Um, um, also with uh, ferritin levels. Okay, to to see whether it's um, an iron deficiency TIBC. And we also look at your platelet count because that would, of course, indicate bleeding. But if all three blood counts, you know, all three blood cells are low, then we point towards your bone marrow. Uh, please read 33.7 on your own. These are the values. Okay, uh, I won't do that again. Again, don't worry about the... MCVs, MCH, MCHC. I believe these are for doctors. I mean, we don't make medical diagnoses. So these levels will, of course, be under the medical responsibility, not for nursing. So this was what I was blabbering about earlier. The iron levels, TIBC, or that's I'm referring to total iron binding capacity. So these are all about iron deficiency anemia. I'm not testing those. Um, Wait, this you're one, not testing so? the, um, the TIBC? No, no. Uh, just stick with your 
Right, okay, so I'll tell you red blood cells, hematocrit, hemoglobin, and of course your platelets. Okay, those okay. are all that we're nursing is concerned about. Because okay. again, we don't make a diagnosis. We don't make medical diagnosis, right? So that will include your retic count or retic count is uh, your reticulocyte count. So you can skip them here on the paragraphs because they explain what they are. So we can. Okay, now for venipuncture. Um, I don't think we need to. Well, you do draw blood as nurses. I just reviewed this. I really don't have a question for blood draw. And I don't I'm not testing these either. Again, the, the uh, ferritin transfer and these are all uh, under the doctor, right? That's for. All right, so we know about bleeding times. We did this in uh, bleeding disorders in NUR 241. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I am more than six feet away from you, so you're good. <laughs> no, you're like less than. Like this? <laughs> okay, we'll so no skip bleeding time, right? No, no, no. And we already finished this one under uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. I'll skip that. Oh, we're done. Let's go to page 677 next. So we're done with the general. Let's go to specific anemias now. So you saw the signs and symptoms, the um, diagnostic procedure and the effects. So those apply to all anemias. Okay, so now let's go to specific anemias now, starting with their etiology, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, which again are, there are common ones, but there are a few specifics applying to each one. So number one is, um, I think we start with sickle cell. Let me see. Oh, iron deficiency first. So by the name itself, what's the problem here? Miss Jira? Low iron. Okay, it's either low iron intake or it could be low iron absorption. These are the conditions that they, will, they may occur in pregnancy, um, which is very common or if the a pregnant woman also have pica. Um, who among you here had pica? And what did you eat? Christy, are you a mom? Yeah, I didn't have pica. You had pica? No. No? Okay. Yeah, oh, so you never got to eat dirt or poop? No. I have a cousin <laughs> that had pods. Pica. Unfortunately, oh. I have a cousin that has pica. She's not pregnant. She just, um, she has not pica because eat well, anyway. pods? no, she eats charcoal, activated charcoal, like oh by the God. jar. Like it's it's crazy. Like she can't go anywhere without it. She's always snacking on it. It's so weird. Is she <laughs> still functioning okay? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, apparently eating activated charcoal is not doesn't kill you. It's not bad for you. Yes. But she has very good, no bad breath though, right? No, but her teeth, like after she eats it, her teeth are black for a little while. But they don't but smell. It's supposed I to, they don't it's smell. Supposed but to no, yeah, it. It, it keeps her mouth very clean. I'll say that. Yeah. Good for her. <laughs> All right, so let's it's, go to it said lead paint walls will cause iron deficiency in the also. I'm sorry? Lead paint walls, a uh, chick paint walls, something yeah. like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, also with um it's not mentioned here, but if you let's say drinks too much milk, mm -hmm. calcium competes with iron as far as uh, absorption goes. 
Um, I Ooh. found this out. Yeah, I had one patient who just, I mean, he's a grown adult. Okay, he's he's a surfer. He just likes milk. Okay, he he drinks about maybe a gallon of milk every day. Oh so God. he had anemia, and then of course, as he grew old, that's when he became symptomatic. And the only history was, um, you know, his his increased um, milk intake, and that's that was the cause. The doctor told me told him to you know, stop that because it does compete with iron um, in the uh, absorption. So between calcium and iron, calcium will be absorbed first after iron. So that was causing his iron deficiency anemia. His increased milk intake. I have one more last question, Professor. Yes. Um, is thalassemia an, an, an anemia? Uh, yes, that is specific only to Mediterranean people, though. Uh, Span the Spaniards, Italians, right around the Mer Mediterranean Sea. So those countries there um, have thal thalassemia. It, it's in their gene. It's not really about the diet and everything. It, it's, it's a genetic disorder. Um, unfortunately, there's no cure for thalassemia, so they just simply require blood, transfusion. um, blood transfusions, right, for the rest of their life. And, you know, that will kill them someday. I mean, they'll, they'll eventually uh, suffer a blood transfusion reaction or an infection from or uh, some other disease from the blood transfusion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, uh, one of those unfortunate um, diseases. <clears throat> so long story short, iron deficiency, I already said the patient has a uh, either a deficiency in the diet or they cannot absorb iron. And we already have a list of the medic of the food that contain iron. So that will be your um, part of your teaching and intervention. Uh, it, here it tells you what the purpose of iron is, why it's necessary for red blood cell production. Please read that on your own. So we saw it on the table on the previous uh, page that this and along with pernicious anemia causes glossitis. This is the smooth, shiny red tongue. Um, when I say red, yes, your tongue looks red already, but uh, this will be really red, like a beef, beefy red. Okay, the really dark red, um, smooth and shiny tongue. Oh, uh, here it is. Okay, so you have, uh, plus you, you see this chelitis here, this um, at the corner of your mouth. Yeah. You see the, um, the inflammation here also. So that's also um, a um, manifestation. So besides the really shiny tongue, you have this inflammation here at the corner of your mouth. And they have these um, brittle nails. <clears throat> Look at the, um, this is again in response to chronic anemia, uh, chronic iron deficiency anemia. Management. So, of course, you're lacking in iron. So, if it's a deficiency in the diet, we simply replace it. Okay. Or let's say tell them to take vitamin C. Okay. That way they can absorb the iron because, again, iron is not going to be useful unless you have vitamin C with it. If they cannot take it by diet, what's the option? Injectable. Okay, injectable or parenteral iron. So iron can be given PO, ferrosulfate. It can be given iron. So that would be, um, what's the name of the iron injection? Um, dextrin. Yeah, that one. It's not dextrin. I'm not sure. Um. um but anyway, it can be given PO, IM, or IV. If it's IV, what is your nursing responsibility? The container of the um, iron must be 
But have you noticed in the bottles or bags that contain iron? When it's brown? It has to be it, dark. Right. Why is it dark? Because it can um, uh, in the thing the light efficacy in light. Right. They get destroyed by sunlight. Right. All right. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, you're right. It is it is dextran here. Iron dextran is your IV form. And here are your foods again. Food sources for iron, B12, and folic acid. Table. Here's a reminder for when you're giving IM iron, the track method must be uh, used. Otherwise, you'll have long chronic skin stains on the inject site, the iron leaks. So you can't wear bikinis because you'll have dark spots. Um, and they're not bruises, okay? They, they look nastier than the bruise. And this is again a, a stain. I mean, they eventually go away, but it will take probably several months before these stains disappear. Mm. Please read the complications on your own. And management, uh, here are your summary of signs and symptoms. Um, some are common, and then these two, the glossitis and the spoon-shaped fingernails are specific to iron deficiency anemia. And interventions, of course, you uh, we said already earlier, what do we do with the activity? Balance, right rest, rest. Okay, and so rest. you um, balance activity with rest, and then this one is specific for iron deficiency anemia, increased iron and vitamin C, and teaching about the food sources again, and that's it. Oh, um, Christy mentioned this earlier. Okay, uh, who has uh, eaten lead here? Eaten what? Lead. I have. <laughs> Maybe unknowingly in, in some... Um... <laughs> anyway. All right, any question on iron deficiency anemia? The next topics will go faster because, again, the, the anemia is anemia. It's just a matter of what's causing it. But the signs and symptoms are similar. The interventions and assessment will have the same pattern. So whatever causes, especially with these nutritional deficiency anemias, they're, they're very similar. Uh, the only difference is this one is iron, and then now we're talking about B12. So, B12, how, how do you get B12 deficiency anemia? Malabsorption. Okay, usually malabsorption. Again, B12 is absorbed in the body with intrinsic body factor. factor. Right. Yeah. So, if you have any GI disease, including stomach disorders, then you will most probably develop this type of anemia. And you have these disorders here, which again affect absorption. Okay, Crohn's disease affects the entire GI tract, unlike um, ulcerative colitis, which only affects the colon. Crohn's disease starts from your mouth all the way to your rectum. Uh, if you also are on uh, the GI drugs, which your peptic ulcer patients are on, that may contribute to B12 deficiency anemia. Or if you simply have low or poor nutritional intake of B12. What other autoimmune disorders other than AIDS can... Um, other than cause, what? Other than AIDS, because they just said autoimmune disorders, AIDS. Is there any more other than AIDS that can cause vitamin B12 deficiency? Um, mm, 
well, Crohn's is the major one. Well, here, well, you have celiac disease also. Yeah, those are not, that's another one. Thank you. Let's go to manifestations now. So if you look under the, um, the, I'll just skip over to the nursing part. Look at the signs and symptoms. They're really no different from general anemia, right? So, so far we've seen the gloss, uh, smooth, red, beefy tongue in uh, iron deficiency anemia, and as well as the spoon shaped um, fingernails. But this one will be same as, you know, all other types of anemia. So that will cover our signs and symptoms. Then management, of course, you have a deficiency in B12. If the diet is simply the problem, then you simply increase the B12 in the diet. However, if it's a malabsorption problem, how do we get the B12 inside the patient? Injection. Injection. Yeah. Right. I am uh, injections of B12. This will be lifelong. They, so they will require um, lifelong injections of B12. Um, and these are your food sources. You have meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy products. Here are some complications. Please read on, on your own. And nursing interventions, again, same thing. So we just say, change the diet from iron to this time B12. I use teaching for your B12 therapy. Um, we also included folic acid here. Mm. Yeah, that's Do it. You for, do you need Z-track method for this injection also? No, no, no. no need. Uh, B12 is colored red, but it doesn't stain. Unlike iron, which really retains its color. Uh, B12, even if, it, if it's red, uh, I've never seen it cause any stain. If the problem is pernicious anemia, because the the route for the B12 is no longer PO, right? We give it by injection. Do you tell the patient to not bother with uh, B12 rich foods? No, no. No, because chances are the patient, um, I mean, the foods listed that are rich in B12, are they only containing B12? No. No. Okay, so no need to pop the patient's bubble, you know, to, to discourage them. Um, still encourage them to eat dietary sources of B12, even if they can't absorb them, because there are other nutrients in uh, these foods besides B12. And that's it. Uh, folic acid, the same thing. This is why I, uh, what I mean by this goes faster because the only difference again is the the cause, and then signs and symptoms are very similar, and uh, interventions are also similar. So this one, the your dietary sources for folic acid, which was already listed in a table um, here, table 30, 34.2 but they mention it here again. Um, who were given folic acid supplements here during pregnancy? I did, I was uh, given. For those who got pregnant Ooh. anyway. So was I. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still pregnant now, but I don't need <laughs> folic acid. <laughs> the doctor you're, gave up, you know. You're pregnant with joy, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I forgot to mention alcoholism. This was mentioned in 
chapter 33 that um, because alcoholism causes malnutrition, so therefore yes. it's always a risk factor for all types of anemia. Right. All right. So this will interfere with iron, B12, folic acid, all the nutrients. And alcoholism will be the major topic when we get to cirrhosis uh, at the end of today. Manifestations, uh, look at under nursing. There's really here, same thing. They're, they're, they're not unique to folic acid deficiency. So these are seen in all types of anemia. Uh, complications, uh, this one mentioned. Um, if it's not mentioned here, what did we learn were, were the uh, complications of any anemia? We had heart, right? We had heart complications. What else? Now the one listed, it, it was also on the table. I don't know, it was on the table. It was a series of paragraphs, sorry. In chapter 33. Well, if you forgot, please go back to chapter 33. And that covers um, folic acid deficiency. Let's move on to sickle cell. Sickle cell is no longer red, a decrease in red blood cell production. Um, so folic acid deficiency anemia was the last one, and now we proceed with increased sickle cell destruction. However, since this is still anemia, will they manifest the same signs and symptoms? Yeah. Yes. This one just has simply a different cause. So sickle cell is inherited. In what um, ethnicity? African American. Okay. Although it does affect other ethnicities, but they most are affecting African Americans. Others are Mediterranean, Middle Eastern uh, ethnicities, also uh, India. Um, yeah, and then a very few. Uh, Caucasians. They didn't mention Asians, and I've really never taken care of a sickle cell patient from Asia. I, I, I don't remember. But I have seen some of the other uh, ethnicities, okay, but uh, very rare. So, what happens in sickle cell disease? This is a chronic condition. So with, as with any other chronic condition, they will have good days, they will have bad days. So the trigger for the sickling, if they have the trait, is hypoxia. I'm looking for the, the triggers. Okay, we'll, we'll come across them. Uh, let's just go through the paragraph. So red blood cells are normally this shape, right, right here, like this. When they sickle, they turn into this shape. Okay, it look, it, it looks like it's um, it's what is this? They um, like they tense up. Okay, and then they lose their spherical shape. They turn into this shape. So when it flows through narrow blood vessels, such as around your joints around the periphery, for instance, wherein the blood vessels become smaller, what happens to blood flow to those areas? Because unlike this shape, when I say disc, I mean disc like D-I-S-C, when unlike these disc-shaped red blood cells, which can squeeze through narrow openings and they're also very flexible, are can you say the same with sickle-shaped red blood cells? No. No, no, these are not flexible. They they can easily obstruct blood flow when they uh, clump together. When they get through tight spaces, unlike the normal um, shape red blood cells, which can which are flexible and can squeeze in and out of tight spaces. 
um, here it tells you here these sickle cells are elongated stiff and they lose their flexibility so again when they run to uh, through a uh, narrow uh, uh, blood vessels that's where they cause trouble and of course they are now sickled so they will carry less oxygen and are fragile they are easily destroyed and they break apart and that's what's causing the anemia so they don't last long they die and then of course they're recycled in the spleen and you have less red blood cells carrying oxygen the sickling episodes triggered again by hypoxic episodes such as when you're smoking when you are doing um, strenuous uh, activities let's say you're um, working out for instance or if you develop a upper respiratory infection or if you're uh, up hiking in the mountains for instance or um, I don't know somebody put a bag over your head um, any other condition again that leads to low oxygen it will trigger a crisis the sickling here is triggered by all those that I mentioned so can they have a sickling episodes when they get the flu yes when they get pneumonia yeah. yes when they smoke whatever it is they're smoking yes Yep, yeah. so any condition that leads to a low blood oxygen level or when you're exerting, for instance, like climbing stairs, okay, so any strenuous activity will lead to a crisis. Can you dehydration as well? <laughs> oh, yes, uh -huh. dehydration will um, cause sickling because they are uh, clumping together. And of course, dehydration will also lead to um, hypoxia. Right? Yeah. So you that will also lead to hypoxemia. So that will again trigger a, um, a sick another sickling episode. So here it is hypoxemia. Oh, here are the um, some of the triggers. So this mentions dehydration, cold temperatures infection because uh, your blood pH drops and so whenever you're in an acidic you have an acidic pH there is less oxygen attaching to your um, hemoglobin um, environments with low oxygen let's say uh, a nightclub okay you have a lot of smokers in a nightclub um, what about deep sea diving Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or yes, yeah, depressurized uh, airplane or mm -hmm. your property mountains. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So our goal, of course, is to prevent hypoxemic episodes. Um, one of the manifestations besides pain, because uh, the patient has anemia, so we have the usual fatigue, shortness of breath. However, during a crisis, there is severe pain. Uh, the pain will, of course, be in the areas where you have a tight circulation, like the joints, the bone, the chest, and the abdomen. This is the worst if you tell me, I mean, if you ask me. So there is a prolonged painful erection. The prolonged part is okay I guess but the painful erection not not okay and there is now kidney and liver damage these are all uh, as a result of this one the um, low blood flow to the abdominal organs uh, there is poor wound healing now uh, we already said that fever I mean an infection triggers a, um, a crisis but the patient will have fever whether or not they have an infection. Um, so that's why will we encourage annual flu vaccinations for these patients? 
Yeah. Yes. All right, they need it because yes, ma'am. Will this uh, cause uh, uh, high risk for pulmonary embolism? Um, good question. Not typically, but once they're in the hospital, though they're in severe pain, they're hospitalized typically two to three times a year. Okay, usually in the winter, uh, we have a lot of sickle cell uh, uh, crisis admissions because, you know, cold temperatures does trigger a crisis. Plus, if these patients develop the flu, you can bet your um, your salary that they will have a crisis when they get when they catch the flu. Um, so it's really when they're admitted in the hospital in severe pain that they 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 have less mobility because they're now staying in bed the whole time. Then they are at risk for DVTs and PEs. Does that make sense? But day to day yes. they're not. Okay, it's only during a sickle cell crisis that yes they are. Um, okay, um, they will require uh, blood transfusions uh, during a crisis. Um, occasionally they won't, but most of the time, yes, they will. On admission to the ER, they will see, they will present with low hemoglobin, with low RBCs, uh, because most of them are already sickled and the body can't replace them fast enough. So they will require one or even two units of uh, pack cells um, in the ER. And that usually is enough for each episode. There is aggressive hydration because you already know the effect of dehydration on the um, sickling. Plus, when there is sickling, if you increase blood volume, that will, of course, let even the sickled cells pass through better now because you have more fluid in your blood. Um, it doesn't affect the sickling, but at least it will promote circulation. So in a way, hydration here, either PO or IV, is part of your pain management. Of course, these patients will ask for pain management. Um, they won't be happy with non-opioids. The, the pain, med pain meds are always either morphine or hydromorphone. So either morphine or Dilaudid, you know, the, the really good stuff because that's how severe the pain is. And because these are young people mostly that have crises, because, I mean, I've seen sickle cell patients grow old, but typically, no. One of the complications eventually causes them to have a shorter lifespan, not to mention the, the frequent blood transfusions. Imagine being admitted in the hospital for two to three times a year. Okay, so one of those, you'll catch something in the hospital. So your death... I have a question. Yes. Can they also lose limbs? Yes, they can lose uh, because of these vaso-occlusive crises. So they may um, have severe obstruction in one or more vessels. So yes, occasionally they will lose um, limbs. They, they can have amputations, but that's not typical. Okay. okay. Um, so what was I saying earlier? Shorter sure, lifespan? Yeah. Okay, so um, I very rarely see old people with uh, sickle cell disease. Hydroxyurea, which is a um, anti-cancer drug, is used for uh, sickle cell, and this is PO. So you know, no need for IV uh, IV treatments. This is uh, taken. These are capsules taken by mouth. Um, however, it doesn't really cure it. it. It just reduces the number of sickling episodes. Uh, are here, here's the statement. Hydroxyurea results in fewer episodes and reduction in acute chest, uh, as chest syndrome in patients with SSC. So there's no cure uh, currently. They are doing these um, 
stem cell transplantation and it's you know it's showing promise but again it's it's not really curing it yet um, we do have genetic uh, manipulation now we have gene therapy um, and uh, a few patients have been uh, cured with gene therapy but as with any other inherited or genetic disorders, um, your cure really would have to be gene editing. Here's the blood transfusions. Um, and like I already said, one of the complications, of course, are related to the blood transfusions. So we're, we're talking about hemolytic transfusion reactions, or it could be something even more, uh, more serious. Oh, here's the um, stem cell transplantation. You, we already discussed this after cancer. Um, same procedure. We we eradicate the patients, um, you know, with with um, really strong uh, chemo to keep to kill it. Um, that of course will depress the pa or suppress the patient's immune system, so they have a chance of having graft versus host disease as opposed to a um, organ rejection or stem cell rejection. So these are some of the complications. So they can have infarcts, uh, even strokes. Okay, so uh, either an MI or a stroke. These are during the crisis episodes. Uh, look at this. Um, I actually have a neighbor um, a few doors down the street. She is uh, from Jamaica. And she had a stroke early on when she was in her, she said 22 years old. She had a stroke already from um, sickle cell. Pregnancy, can they get pregnant? Yeah. Is it safe though? No. Yeah, that's the problem. So it's, um, a really plus the pregnancy itself will cause hypoxemia because that will increase oxygen demand because now she has to feed the growing fetus as well. Um, so the placenta will uh, require more red blood cells uh, from the from the mom. So th this pregnancy itself may cause um, a sickling episode. And so OB complications are these, so they may, they may, and there's a chance they lose the pregnancy. And because this is anemia, here are your signs and symptoms. There's jaundice here because is this uh, red blood cell, decreased red blood cell production, or is this increased red blood cell destruction? Destruction. This is destruction, and and whenever you destroy red blood cells, one of the uh, byproducts, of course, will be bilirubin, right? Because you're destroying the hemi and the globin, um, and when the spleen recycles that, that will result in jaundice. And that's it. So for teaching, you. Tell the patient that it's really important to avoid episodes of um, hypoxemia. So get your annual flu. Um, actually, they're also candidates for the pneumonia vaccine, uh, even if they're less than 65 years old. In the hospital, these are your interventions, oxygen, hydration, pain management, blood transfusions as necessary, uh, antipyretics, and um, support measures here will come in the form of 
therapy the communication you know, knowing that this is lifelong and these are these are a young people's disease uh, again i i don't see very many people uh, reach over 50. okay Al although there probably are um 50 year olds with sickle cell disease but um typically they don't have a, a normal life expectancy any questions and here is your teaching again related to preventing the sickling episodes questions all right let's take a break when we come back at 10 20 we'll proceed with polycythemia and after that we'll do uh, liver problems questions before we go no all right see you at 10 20. <laughs> 